So today we're going to be talking about calibrated component databases versus warranty data. We're going to look at what's the difference between them and look at some examples as well. So as you may know, there's a couple of ways of getting failure rates, such as FAMITAs and field returns and warranty data process. Um, and we're going to look at all of those um, along with a comparison today and how to and figure out how to achieve realistic failure rates and why that is so important. For those of you that have not met me yet, my name is Lauren Stewart and I'm a CFSE here at Exeter. Um, I work a lot with our mechanical customers, helping them achieve um, certification and SIL certification. And I'm also an instructor at Exeter Academy, um, help teach um, functional safety and do these webinars. I see a few new people that I haven't seen before, so welcome. In case you do not know about Exeter, just briefly, we're a global um, company. We have people all over the world to help with functional safety, alarm management, and cybersecurity. So no matter where you are, where your customers are, where your products are coming, from where they're going to, we have people close by that can help you achieve all of your functional safety needs and goals. And one other thing I quickly like to brag about Exeter is we like to excuse the pun, but be an open book. Everything that we're researching, everything, all of our process, procedures, everything we do, we publish. We want to, um, if we're learning things and achieving higher safety, we want to get that message out there in the world. So we have these free webinars, we have free blogs, we have books, we have, we go to conferences, we have white papers, um, all trying to get that information out. So if you ever need more information on a subject, um, we probably have the resources to explain it to you and help you out more. But let's get to why we're really here. Um, and that's all about the FAMIA, warranty returns, um, field failure estimations. And we're going to get into all of that along with a lot of examples. However, um, we're going to start right at the basics. I like to have a clean slate and define some things first up, like what do we really consider a failure to be and what is a failure rate and what the standards say about them before we apply um, what we're seeing in the real world. So let's go ahead and get into what a failure really is. Well, many people, depending on what different industry you're in, could have a different idea of what a failure is. So we wanted to break down the definition for something very generic, simple, very easy, simple, that can simply get across the definition on to multiple people. So a failure realistically is when a device just cannot do its job. It cannot perform its intended function. And if you think about that, it's regardless of cause. It doesn't really matter why the valve could not close in the end. The end result was the valve didn't close. It couldn't do its job. It couldn't stop the process flow. So when you think about a failure, broken down to the most simplistic means of when a device cannot do its job, it really doesn't matter if it was customer abuse, it doesn't matter what it was, the real failures could have happened or did happen. Uh, real dangerous conditions could have resulted. Um, so now that we know what a failure is, how do we define what a failure rate is? Well, failure rates are a number of failures per a unit of time per a piece of equipment. 
it's usually assumed to be a constant value and it can be broken up into many different pieces. Um, you might have heard of your safe failure rates, your dangerous failure rates, your detected failure rates, undetected. Um, there's even things like common cause. Um, failure rates are usually expressed um, in this Greek symbol lambda and are usually in the unit of measurement of fits, if you've heard of failures in time or failure units or fits. Um, and that's kind of how the standard relates to them as well. So if you are buying a certified product or if you're getting your product certified, often you will have a product failure rate in fits or by this lambda. And that's what can go into all of those fun calculations for to figure out the safety and the SIL and the PFD average and that all good stuff. So now we know what a failure is and what a failure rate is. What do the standards say about them? It doesn't matter if you are an end user or a manufacturer. If you're using IEC 61508 or IEC 61511, both um, standards define failure rates and say not only do you have to use failure rates, but they need to be quality data as well. These Failure rates are going into calculations, and they need to be credible, traceable, documented, and justified. Um, in the previous editions of the standards, they just said, this is what a failure rate is, use it. Now they really upped the language in both the new versions of the standards to kind of emphasize their point that it needs to be because these failure rates are going into very important equations, they need to be credible, they need to be traceable, they need to be documented and justified. Previously, um, when the old edition of the standards were coming out, um, there wasn't much emphasis on this because there wasn't a we weren't seeing a lot of issues in the field. However, um, everybody in the standard kind of saw that things being a little abused or um, taken advantage of, and they saw extremely low failure rates, and that was scary to a lot of the end users. So the language did get strengthened in hopes that those unrealistic failure rates um, will kind of be faded out and that people won't be using them anymore. I like to think of um, the failure rates um, and functional safety kind of as a bridge of safety. And the standards, no matter if you're using IEC 61508 or IEC 61511, um, they can get you to the other side of um, trouble if you follow all of their, their steps, their directions. They can help achieve your functional safety needs. However, if you are just picking and choosing which part of the standards you want to use, um, is that a bridge you're going to want to walk across? If you're using overly optimistic failure rates, it's going to lead to unsafe design. We're going to get into all of that along with some examples later on. Where do failure rates come from? Well, there in functional safety, there are two common techniques to collect failure rates. You can predict them or you can estimate them. Just like everything in life, there are pros and cons with both of these analysis. Um, first of all, you have failure rate prediction, and that's going to be um, a study or a stress strength analysis or um, test results or a combination of all of it. And that's going to let you look at des design and predict what the failure rate's going to be. The good thing about these, the prediction, is you can use it on an old device that you've had for 50 years out in the field, or you could have it on a brand new technology or device because you're predicting what that failure rate could be. Um, one of the most common ways to predict failure rates 
is an FMEDA or a failure mode effect in diagnostic analysis. And that's what us here at Exeter use to predict failure rates. And we're going to look at what that is and how we do that coming up. Um, the second way of predicting failure rates is through an estimation technique. And estimating failure rates is usually done on looking at historical data like field return data, um, end users field studies, that type of information. Um, but the most common technique is that manufacturer field return data study. So let's first look into the predictive techniques and the FMEDA. So as I said, FMEDA stands for Failure Modes Effect and Diagnostic Analysis. And what we do is we look at a device um, broken up into their bill of material in either an exploded view or a cutaway view, and we look at how it will react when we throw any sort of stress onto that design. So we're going to look at the strength of the design per the stresses that could um, this device could see or could come across. An FMEDA is a lot like an FMEA, but um, combined with the Military Handbook 217 stress methods, plus looking at diagnostic analysis, we can expand that and achieve component failure rates and failure modes um, along with diagnostic coverage and its effectiveness. As I said before, this can be used on old products, things that have been made and haven't changed forever, or it can be used on a newly designed device. Um, and that you can do that by knowing the failure rates of each component that go into that device for a set of stress strength factors. When we finish with an FMEDA, um, we get failure rates, failure modes, diagnostic coverage, um, useful life, proof test coverage, all by just looking at and studying the design against all of the stresses that it could see. When we do an FMEDA, we perform it on a very particular device. It's not just a floating ball valve. It is a particular company, a particular make, model, manufacturer down to knowing exactly where that's going to go. Is it going to be a sub-C device? Is it going to be um, protected and cabinet mounted? And um, what environments will it see? And we detail every failure mode um, that's given in that component and des the design for all the stress levels that that design could see, including the environment. And based on how that design can react to those stressors, that environment, um, along with any design margins, any automatic diagnostics. Um, we can predict those dangerous failure rates, safe failure rates, um, proof test coverage, useful life, all of those really important pieces of information that are on the certificate and reports. When we do a FAMIDA, we do it on both environment specific, as I mentioned, but also application specific to see exactly how that device is going to be operating. Um, if you take an example, um, sorry, because I'm mechanical, I always go to the mechanical examples. If you think of a valve, for example, um, a valve could be set up open on trip or close on trip. So a failure in one condition on maybe it's stuck and cannot um, close. If it's a close on trip application, that could be dangerous. If it's an open on trip application and it is stuck open, that could be a safe failure. So along with the environment, we also look at how that application is going to be set up as well. As I said earlier, there are pros and cons with everything in life, and FAMIDAs are the same way. What 
the FAMIDA strength is, is not only how the analysis is done, but also the component database behind the FAMIDA. So when you are looking at a FAMIDA or having a FAMIDA done, make sure and ask questions about their component database. Make sure it's going to be an apples to apples comparison um, with the environment, with the application, with the stress factors. Um, if you are a sub C valve, having a telecom um, field study comparison for a database is not going to be um, lend you with the most appropriate results. Um, my mom always said garbage in is garbage out. It doesn't matter what you do, how many bows, or you wrap it up nice and pretty. In this case, no matter how great your FAMIDA technique is or how great your calculations are, if you start with garbage, you're going to get garbage results. Just quickly, I can tell you about our database. Um, we have a calibrated database here at Exeter um, that we continuously update. Um, we look at manufacturers' data, um, data from um, end users, ARITA, um, all of the FAMITAs, and we continuously um, kind of do a sanity check, make sure that everything is coming out the same bounds and in the same realm. If something is out of whack, we go in and investigate why. Is this um, just an outlier or is there something that needs to be um, calibrated in our database? So our database kind of combines both those estimated results from looking at the manufacturer studies, the end user studies, ARITA, and combining it with the FAMIDA and, or the predictive results. So let's switch gears and go over to the estimation technique. Um, as I said, the most common estimation technique is manufacturer's field return studies. And manufacturer's field return studies is incredibly valuable information. However, there's a limit to what you can do with it with how much you have. Um, some manufacturer field return studies are very, very detailed, while others um, leave a little to be desired. Um, we've seen from company to company, manufacturer to manufacturer, but even just with sister sites in the same company, um, they have different interpretations of what they count as a failure and what they um, actually see returned. So first of all, if you're thinking about doing a manufacturer field return study, think about what the product is. Um, are all returns going to be um, told to you um, or not? Are all failures counted? A lot of companies mark, oh, no problem found or systematic failure and user and don't actually look into why it broke or what happened. Um, a lot of the times it's just a check, bar, check box to mark off and just to move on to the next part. Um, once again, not all failures are returned to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer might not know the actual operating hours. Sometimes there's a counter on them, but oftentimes um, you don't know if a person is going to buy multiple and they're just going to sit on the shelf in case something breaks. Let's go back to um, remembering um, what our definition of a failure was. Our definition of a failure is that device didn't do its job. However, most manufacturers' definition of failures are when a device performs its intended function within the specified environment, within the operational limits, completely maintained per the manufacturer's constructions. And that basically says that it's always maintained, it's perfectly updated, it's perfectly prepared. So repaired, sorry. Um, so often it, a lot of real failures might be thrown out and the results are actually quite low when you're comparing them to um, real failure counts or something like an FMEDA. 
I learn best from examples, so I wanted to put a bunch of examples in this webinar um, to help explain myself. So I wanted to show you those four main points where we just looked at um, things that manufacturers might not know that limits how that um, field return study will be done. So those four points, first of all, the manufacturer doesn't know the actual operating hours. Once again, if you have a timer on your device, that's a different case, but most of the time, we don't know if multiple are bought, is sitting on the shelf for um, backup. We've seen a lot of field failure studies that assumes that the device goes into operation immediately or a week or two weeks after shipment. And that's going to be very optimistic. When we do field failure studies, we use at least six months um, after shipment to start up is our assumption built in. Next, we're going to look at not all failures are returned to the manufacturer. Think of what device we're looking at. And think of, compared to the entire SIF, was that expensive or not? Um, not to pick on a solenoid, but solenoids usually aren't the most expensive um, piece of equipment in your safety system. So if that solenoid breaks, it may be easier for your end user just to grab an extra one off the shelf, put it in, and toss it. Not necessarily take the time to stop and call you, get a replacement, or do an investigation. However, if you are a high dollar item in that SIF, um, maybe you will get more calls than the lower price items. So when we talk um, about manufacturer field return um, studies, we usually choose a return rate assumption. It can be anywhere from 10, 50, or 70 percent um, are found actually returned. Then we look at not all returns are failures and not all failures are counted. Um, these kind of go together. So when we say comp look at everything if you can, um, compile all failures that came in and sort them into this is obviously a problem, this is a failure, let's look into it, this could be a failure or this customer just had the wrong paint color. That's obviously not an issue. And look at everything that could have been a failure. Expand your bounds a little bit. If that product was in operation at that time, would it have done its job properly? And with knowing all of this, we suggest doing your calculations um, more with a confidence interval than just a straight up field failure calculations. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that are going into these field failure data studies. So when we look at it, we like to have a lower bounds and upper bounds and also confidence estimates. We're 90% or 70% confident interval. So let's take a look at real examples now that we know what to do. Um, Depending on those assumptions that I just talked about could make a huge swing in what the failure rate for the product is. So let's take this example. It's the exact same product, the exact same operating hours. So we did not change that at all. We have the same number shipped for the same amount of time. The only thing that we're going to change is the reported percentage of failures um, and also some of the failures that were reported. So two of those assumptions that we said we didn't quite know on the last slide are kind of fuzzy on this slide. So we're going to do a lower bounds. We're going to say we're only going to take the definite failures and we're going to say, well, I'm assuming that we were told almost everything at 90%. So looking at the this device, we can have a lower bounds of 151 fits. 
On the other hand, we want to create an upper bounds and say, let's count those maybes as well in the failure count. So all of the definites and the maybes. And instead of saying, um, we're going to be told of 90% of the failures, let's only look and assume we're only going to be told about 10% of those failures. And you can make an upper and lower bound for your field failure data sets. So on this example, we saw a, we were actually said, sent this and said, does this make sense? We have questions about it. So on the certificate, this shows a failure rate of for a floating ball valve of 109 fits and a trunnion ball valve of 210 fits. And on the certificate, it says um, the origin of the values. And it explains that um, these values are a result of analysis of field feedback from the last five years. Um, random and systematic failures, which are the responsibility of the manufacturer, were examined. Um, and then below it, it lists the assumptions. Only the manufacturer defects or failures. The maintenance had to be up to date per the safety manual. It had to be within environment and operational limits, but it doesn't say any other of the assumptions used. We don't know all of those other kind of fuzzy areas or variables that could go into this manufacturer field return study. So when um, we are doing a comparison, we look at um, the shipping and return information um, for at least five years. We categorize all of the failures into failure or not a failure. Um, we assume six months after shipment for startup, and then we're going to uh, choose a return rate assumption. Um, are a lot of them going to be told about or not very many at all? And then we use um, a calculation and make a lower bounds and upper bounds and 70 and 90 percent confidence factor if needed. And then we compare those results to an FMEDA. Oftentimes, the results are going to be under the FMEDA, which, because of all the assumptions going in, is expected. So let's look at some real examples. Um, the first couple of data sets are all going to be different logic solvers. So first, we're going to look at a field failure data study. This is a high-powered logic solver. And we did the sorted through the failures, what's a failure, what's not, and 100 failures were reported. Um, we assumed that the um, re number, the percent reported were 70%, and we were able to do our warranty study, which came out to 1,287 fits, and compared that to the FMEDA results. The FMEDA results were 2,200 fits. And as you can see, it came out at the 70% confidence interval. Um, the next example, once again, a logic solver. Same thing, a high power um, logic solver. This field return study issued a warranty result of 428 fits. And the FAMIDA data came out to 3,600 fits. So this data study was at the 90% confidence interval. Then we come to, um, once again, another logic solver, high power. Um, this data study came out to 583 fit or 38 fits, where the FAMIDA was just over 3,000. That comes out to the 70% confidence interval. Another one, this one's a medium power, so switch it up slightly. So the FAMIDA came out um, less. It is 983 fits compared to um, 70 per, or 29 fits. We, this is kind of because there weren't a, this is a lower number, um, fell in between the 70% and the 90% confidence factors.
And then, um, finally, we have one more um, logic solver. It's a high-powered where the um, field data study came out to 1020 fits and the FAMIDA came out to 2700 fits and that falls in the 70% category as well. So putting these together, and we did a lot more of these, not just these five data sets, but this was just a snapshot of the summary. We looked at the product complexity. We looked at um, the estimated hours, the number of reported um, failures, and compared the manufacturer field return lambda to the calibrated FAMIDA lambda and came out with that kind of um, benchmark almost. And we came out with the number, the field return studies somewhere, fall somewhere between 3 and 56 percent of the rest of the world, kind of. So that's not just FAMIDAs. It's also looking at end user benchmark studies and ARIDA. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with read ARIDA, it's the Offshore and Reliability um, Handbook from the North Sea that um, looks at oil platforms there. Um, and these are often um, the manufacturer's data studies alone, if you look at them, are often well below um, generic or even the cell safe data limits. Um, so at Exeter, we always publish the calibrated FAMIDA results in the certificates and the FAMIDA report, not just the manufacturer's field return studies, because there are so many assumptions that go into them. Um, another um, more visual example, we looked at some solenoids. We looked at a bunch of FAMIDAs, um, different complexity of solenoids, poppet, solenoid, uh, spool solenoids, and compared that to solenoids from different end user studies. We looked at the Dow field failure studies, a pipeline, and the ARETA um, comparison. And you can see all the blues and greens kind of um, align up with each other, where um, the manufacturer's data, field data studies alone, come at much lower results. Um, maybe those came because of so many of those assumptions built into the studies. Another example, um, we looked at a field return um, certificate, and the certificate came out to 17.3 fits. Um, we typically see the exact same actuator, or not the same manufacturer, but the same type of actuator falling between 400 and 1,200 fits, depending on the complexity. And a FAMIDA was done with the um, FAMIDA technique and the calibrated database, and it came out to 600 fits. So just looking at the manufacturer field return data study could grossly underestimate your failure rates. After we compared tons and tons of data, we looked at hundreds of thousands of operating hours, hundreds of um, devices and types of equipment, um, it's clear that while manufacturers return data studies can be very valuable piece of information, you can lower your failure rates by diving into that information and solving your problems. However, just using that information for failure rates, especially in calculations, can provide extremely optimistic results. So even if you're calculations are technically correct, that garbage in is that garbage out. And that's because those assumptions are made um, beforehand, before you even see that. And to wrap up this webinar, I'm going to end with questions, but to wrap up, think of why those safety systems are in place in the first place. We normally think of failure rates as in fits and 10 to the negative 9, and those numbers are so, so tiny in billions of hours, and we kind of get lost on what it's really doing. The whole reason that safety system or that device is going into a safety system, the whole reason that safety system is going into that plant or that 
rig or wherever it's going is because it needs to reduce risk. You need to reduce personnel, environmental, and financial risk. So if the device that needs to do its job when called upon cannot, your SIF or that safety system will not be able to do its job. The whole reason you have those is to prevent serious and potential deadly disasters. Um, so using optimistic failure rates might not seem like a big deal, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're doing your calculation or looking at their certificate, but re zoom out for a minute. Remember that big picture. Where is that device going? Where is that device? Who is that device going to protect against? Um, I sometimes make my calculations a little conservative, but when I do that, um, I always design my safety systems as if somebody I loved was going to be working right next to it. And because of that, I can sleep pretty well at night. So when you're looking at failure rates, also remember that bigger picture, who you are trying to protect against. The safety system went in because it was not safe enough just to open the doors to begin with. So I'm going to now take some time for questions. Um, and if you have any later, please feel free to email me. If you have ideas from webinars, um, feel free to send us an an email, um, check out our website. We have a bunch of those books and white papers that I was telling you about. It has a lot of great and free information. And if you want more, we're all over social media. Um, we have LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Let us know. Um, the first question is, if you are here for this um, webinar, you will get a copy of the slides, and this is recorded, so it will be posted to our um, website and our YouTube station, so you can always check back to it. Um, the next question we have is, um, does Exeter have any recommendations or guidance on failure rate modifiers um, for processes that may not be clean or may not be as um, conducive? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have, we look at both clean service or severe service, um, and we do have some of that in the process. Um, if you want to reach out to me, Joe, and um, send me an email, I can get you um, some more specific information. The next question we have, is it okay to mix handbook data and manufacturer's data within one FMEDA? Um, I wouldn't mix it within one FMEDA, but I would use it to compare. So I would do an FMEDA with all one component handbook or one component database. Then I would compare that FMEDA to other um, data books. Well, if you are offshore or subsea, Arita is a great one if you know, if you can match up the bounds the same. Um, so I wouldn't mix in within one FAMIDA, but I would use that FAMIDA to compare. Um, the next question we have is the manufacturer failure rate provided on the on the FAMIDA, excuse me, and um, are the assumptions included? So I can't speak for everyone. I can only speak for Exida. When we do a manufacturer failure rate study, those um, are not provided in the FAMIDA uh, report 
or the certificate. We use those as that check for the FEMITA to make sure that both of them are kind of within the same realm. If the end user or if the manufacturer fuel return study was extremely low or extremely high compared to the FEMITA, then we would go back and question it. However, um, we do not um, provide that portion of the study with um, the certificate or the FEMITA itself. Um, as I gave that one example on the certificate, it did list on a different certificate. It did list some of the assumptions, but I can't speak more on that. I'm sorry. Um, I think I got them all. Um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. And thank you so much for joining um, this webinar and have a great day. Thank you.